Welcome, everyone, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During today's conference, we will be conducting a questions and answer session. So if you would like to ask a question by phone, please press star 1. Today's conference is also being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Margaret Farrell. Thank you, and you may begin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Margaret Farrell, and on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I'd like to welcome everyone to the April Research to Reality Cyber Seminar. NCI launched the Research to Reality Community of Practice several years ago with the aim of bringing together researchers and practitioners in an ongoing discussion around both the promise and the perils of moving evidence-based programs and policies into practice. How very fortunate are we today to be able to highlight a topic of interest to so many in public health and the cancer control field, the interrelatedness of nutrition, environment, physical activity, and obesity prevention. Our first speaker, Dr. Melissa Laska, is Associate Professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Dr. Laska's primary research interests are in environmental, social, and behavioral determinants of obesity among young people, including access to healthy foods in underserved communities. Next, Peggy Neron is the newly appointed as the Director of External Affairs and Strategic Initiatives for the Chronic Disease Prevention and Control at the New Jersey Department of Health. Under her leadership, the department coordinates Shaping NJ, a public-private partnership of more than 230 organizations working together to address the obesity epidemic by promoting healthy communities through improved nutrition and increased opportunities for physical activity throughout the state of New Jersey. Each of our speakers will offer a unique perspective on the opportunities and directions for how researchers and practitioners can collaborate with one another to improve the health of their communities to share resources, approaches, and interventions. Full bios for each of today's speakers are available on researchtoreality.cancer.gov, where you will also be able to engage in the discussion forum on today's topic and others as well as to view an archive of previous cyber seminars. The final part of this call, as always, is devoted to your questions and comments. Um, at any time during the presentation, please press star 1 to be placed in the queue to ask your question live during the question answer portion of the seminar. Or if you prefer, you can also submit your questions using the Q&A function at the top of your screen, just typing your question and hit ask. We specifically and warmly welcome those of you who are joining us today for the first time to engage in the discussion on the call and online with the R2R Community of Practice. We thank you all so very much for joining us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Melissa, to get us started. Thank you. Thanks so much. Today I'm going to talk about community health promotion and multifactorial partnerships focusing on one specific aspect of the food environment, and that's small corner stores. And then Perry's work will follow this up and, and provide some context for how this kind of approach can be layered into a more comprehensive community-wide strategy for promoting energy balance. Food access has um, really become an increasingly high-profile issue for health professionals and the scientific community. We've come to recognize in a really widespread way that all Americans do not have equal access to healthy food, and, and there's quite a robust literature now suggesting that there are systematic disparities in healthy food access. Some of the research in this area has suggested that there are four times more supermarkets in primarily white versus primarily black neighborhoods, and that low, lower income neighborhoods may have twice as many convenience stores or corner stores, which are stores that typically stock less healthful foods compared to higher income neighborhoods. So in full, these kinds of disparities in access to healthy food could really underlie, at least in part, many of the health disparities in, in health-related outcomes that we observe across the U.S. So we've been working on, on these issues in small urban food stores for the last five or ten years, and I think these are really interesting venues for health promotion in this way for a variety of reasons. Um, these stores already exist within the community. They're small businesses that are often owned or operated by people who are invested in the neighborhood to some extent. 
and they're places where customers make frequent trips. In between what other mice might be major shopping trips to a larger store, so these kinds of stores can provide multiple touch points with customers, which is really nice. Our, our first experience here at the university and, and with my team, our first experience really doing research inside of con convenience stores began in 2008, um, 2007, 2008 through Healthy Eating Research, which is a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And in 2007, Healthy Eating Research convened a corner store working group dedicated to looking at specific issues within small food vendors that, that may facilitate or prohibit um, enhancing healthy food access. And at the time, our group was composed of members from Baltimore, Maryland, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, Oakland, California, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And what we realized in our working group through our, our, the beginning of our conversations was that we didn't really have a sense or a good quantification of what kinds of healthy foods might already be available in these stores. We knew um, w with some certainty that there was a lot of unhealthy prepackaged energy dense food in these stores, but we really didn't have a sense, are there any healthy products available? And what, what kinds of stores are they available in? Or to what extent are they available in these stores? And so we designed a, an audit to go into these stores and, and in each of our communities and quickly assess healthy food availability. And so here's the data just from the Twin Cities in Minnesota. These are data from 63 convenience stores and corner stores located within walking distance of all of our junior and senior high schools in um, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And what we see here is that everyone, all of the corner stores um, have, or nearly all of the corner stores, have access to things like regular potato chips and other less healthful snack foods. But as you look down the graph here, you can see that more healthy snack foods are much less prominent in these stores, though it's interesting to note that some stores do stock these kinds of, of products. So there may be some kind of model for stocking and selling these kinds of healthy foods in a limited number of stores. And in fact, these findings were echoed in our data collection across the sites where healthy food is, food, foods and beverages, including snack foods and staple items that you take home and serve to your family, um, were, were not necessarily prominent in these stores, though there were a number of stores at every site that did stock these kinds of items. And it's interesting to note, though, that when these items were available, the selection was extremely limited in quantity and in variety. So if, I, if healthy items were available, there might only be one or two products that were, that were healthy snack products in a given store, and so there's still a lot of room for improvement here. We also realized through this initial work that there was a really significant geographic variability in store stocking and, and really fundamentally what stores looked like. So in some sites, stores were extremely small, very, very small single aisle stores that had very limited space within the stores for stocking foods in general. And in other sites, for example, like in Minneapolis and St. Paul, our stores are still relatively small, but a bit larger in that they have maybe four or five very short aisles and have a bit more space inside the store to work with. And so this geographic variability in what stores really look like, for us, underscored the need and the importance of doing formative work in a specific site before continuing on with any kind of programmatic development or intervention development and really understanding what a specific community looks like and what their needs are before moving forward. Now at the same time that we were doing this initial, uh, this initial assessment work in the Twin Cities, the Minneapolis Health Department also became interested in, in doing some work related to health promotion in corner stores in Minneapolis. And several years later, they ended up launching the Minneapolis Healthy Corner Store Program. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this program because I think it has some similar aims and structure to other healthy corner store programs that are going on now across the U.S. The Minneapolis Healthy Corner Store Program was implemented in, by the health department in two phases. 
In phase one, there were nine stores included, and in phase two, there were 30 stores included. Really, the overarching goal of this program is to support store owners in making produce more visible, affordable, and attractive. And in, in phase one, the program was really implemented by the health department, and the health department was very hands-on with all of the stores that they were working with. In phase two, there was an interest in expanding reach, and so the health department partnered with a number of community-based organizations where these organizations could act as liaisons between the health department and the stores and their community that, that were serving their customers. The health department implemented the, the corner store program in several steps. The first step is to recruit the stores and conduct a really in-depth assessment where a staff member goes into the store and does a, does a very detailed assessment of what's available, what stocks in the store, what the infrastructure is like, what the capacity for change is like in the store. They also do a really in-depth interview with the store owner or manager. And then all of that information feeds into an individualized plan for store enhancements. So the health department provides an enhancement support by providing merchandising assist assistance through baskets and other display cases for fresh fruits and vegetables. They provide expertise on layout design, uh, point of purchase displays and signage. They also provide produce handling training when needed and try to troubleshoot potential areas for challenges with the store. Here we see an example of one of the corner store owners from phase two of the project. He's displaying the healthy uh, fruits and vegetables available in his store. And the final piece of the program is a community engagement piece where, for example, here you see a table set up outside of one of the corner stores sponsored by a local community-based organization that was partnering with the health department here. There are cooking demonstrations and taste tests and really just a concerted effort to, to get customers aware of the changes that are going on inside of the store and the new types of food available and also getting them to taste and experience the food, uh, potentially for some people for the first time. From the university perspective here, we partnered with the health department on, on a small piece of the evaluations that they've done related to their Healthy Corner Store program. Um, in, in some evaluation work that we help support them in looking at point of sale data and cash register receipts and also customer intercept surveys, we are in fact seeing kind of movement in the right direction with um, changes that we would expect to see related to these information uh, intervention strategies that we're conducting in the stores. So for example, fruit and vegetable sales appear to increase in intervention stores compared to fruit and vegetable sales in, in two control stores that later received a delayed intervention. We also saw more favorable perceptions of overall neighborhood fruit and vegetable availability among customer customers in intervention stores compared to control stores. And I think, by and large, these types of results reflect the larger body of literature in corner store programs and corner store interventions that's going on across the United States now, where we're seeing, again, movement in the right direction in terms of the outcomes that we, that we would expect to see based on it, our intervention strategies, though there's still a lot of room for, for improvement and, and work that remains to be done in terms of understanding impacts on, on long-term outcomes and, and individual level customer variables. And Joel Gittleson, uh, who's at Hopkins, summarized these data, summarized these outcome data for, for published intervention studies in a very nice paper that was published just a year or two ago um, in Preventing Chronic Disease. It's a literature review that looks at corner store interventions in general and their findings. But as we, we, as we kind of reflected on the impact or the potential impact of these intervention studies, one of the things that my colleagues and I uh, really started to talk a lot about was the fact that there didn't seem to be enough of a dialogue that we felt um, going on around lessons learned from these small store interventions. And so these can be really, these small stores can be really challenging environments to work in. 
small store owners are, have a variety of challenges that, ahead of them as they operate their small businesses. And I think it's really critical to understand these lessons learned in small store programs in order to be implementing the program successfully. And so what we were commissioned by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to do is to do a case study analysis where we examined a lot of these lessons learned that don't, these lessons learned don't necessarily make it into published peer-reviewed literature, but it's all the other stuff that you need, that you need to know before moving forward with this kind of program. And so in our case study analysis here, we had four sites that we were looking at. <clears throat> we had Baltimore, Maryland, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Burlington, North Carolina, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all of which had corner store programs, healthy corner store programs going on in these communities. And, and we had a number of themes in terms of lessons learned that emerged from this work. I'm just going to hit on the very key highlights that I think are the most prominent and the most important. But if you're interested in kind of a deeper dive in, into these lessons learned, this work was published in the American Journal of Health Behavior in 2014 and is available, is available for viewing and reading. So some of the most important highlights that I think we, we hit upon were, number one, establishing relationships with store owners. <coughs> it's, it's really important to establish a strong relationship with the store owners that you're working with. Um, rapport building and trust building takes a significant amount of time, and so it shouldn't be underestimated how much time you need to dedicate to really the initial kind of building before launching into any kind of programmatic approach. It's also important to recognize customer relationships that the store owner or manager may have. And it can be quite difficult to develop a program a priori and then just come into a store and roll it out exactly as planned. It's really important to access the knowledge and the expertise that store owners have of their customer base and of the way the stores operate so that you can utilize that in adapting inter any intervention strategy and really trying to customize it and tailor it to what the store needs. In designing the program, there are a number of different important considerations to keep in mind. I mentioned before the importance of formative work. Formative research is really critical, and especially site-specific formative work. Understanding what the community is about, what the neighborhood looks like, what the needs are, is really important in moving forward. It's also critical that you focus on both supply and demand. I think the last thing we want to do is to have corner store owners losing money because we're asking them to stock a wide variety of healthy food, particularly perishable healthy food, and then not having people purchase that healthy food. So thinking about ways of engaging customers, I mentioned this in the Minneapolis uh, corner store program where there have been taste tests and cooking demonstrations. Certainly those have been done in a number of other sites across the country. And there may be other really innovative and unique ways of engaging customers in the community to get behind a corner store. We know that especially in certain locations, distribution can be challenging for store owners. So it's critical that staff work with store owners to identify sources of healthy foods, make sure that they're able to identify what healthy foods are, identify sources where they can have delivery in quantities that are acceptable, in a frequency that's acceptable, and at a price that's acceptable. That means that they can pass that on to their customers. Evaluation is also an important part of the corner store program process that shouldn't be overlooked, including both process evaluation and outcome evaluation. So it's really important to, to, to evaluate implementation to ensure that the program was implemented in the way that was expected. And it's also important to, to, to analyze at some point, if possible, the impact on customers. These can be really difficult and and uh, resource intensive things to, to evaluate. And so here's a case where partnering, a partnership with a community and a university researcher team can be really beneficial in getting the best possible outcomes for the work. And then finally, sustainability is important and, and is a real challenge in this type of programmatic approach. Um, 
what we've seen often in, in our programs that have been ongoing is that continued support and a continued presence with the store owner really helps reinforce healthy food activities and help, helps enforce sustainability over time. But once you no longer have that reinforcement, it can become really challenging for store owners to, to continue stocking healthy food and, and continue maintaining the changes that you made in those stores. So when possible, it's really important to encourage owners to adopt infrastructure or other systems-based changes when that's at all feasible. And it's also important to think not only about programmatic approaches, but also about policy-based approaches in addressing these issues. And this is the last thing that I'm just going to touch on for about a minute, <clears throat> is thinking about the, the work in this area has almost all been related to programmatic approaches, where individual staff members are going into stores or community liaisons are going into stores and working one-on-one -on -one with store owners or managers to help work through problems and sort out issues and stock and sell healthier food. Um, what, what's nice is if we can think about policy-based approaches, which may support that sustainability piece and reaching a much larger audience when the resources are limited and when you're simply not able to expand your programmatic approaches in the way that you'd like. <clears throat> so in thinking about these policy approaches, some places have thought about um, adopting a kind of healthy corner store certification program. Other, other, in other areas, we as well as other people have looked at uh, vendor-specific regulations tied to food assistance programs like WIC or SNAP and how that might affect small store owners. And the one thing that I'd like to mention is the possibility for local ordinance that also address staple foods. So in Minneapolis, we're in a somewhat unique position that we have a staple food ordinance that mandates that any store that, that has a, a, a license to be a food store and carry and sell food needs to carry certain kinds of food. This ordinance was passed in 2008, and there's now a proposal on the table that's yet to be approved by city council, but a proposal that involves a series of upgrades to that ordinance. The original ordinance uh, contains four different food types that eligible stores are required to stock. I've just shown you some examples here, but those include fruits and vegetables, breads and cereals, also dairy and meat products. And in the, in the proposal that's, that's now on the table, we're considering a variety of upgrades to that ordinance, which would involve a number of healthy foods with specific quantities, and again, any eligible store that has a license to be a food store in the city of Minneapolis would be required to stock these, these items with the support and technical assistance of the health department. So it's an interesting policy change, and we're in a position to evaluate this policy should it move forward. I think the results will be forthcoming as to how effective they are. So in summary, I think the key points that I touched on today are that corner stores are an important part of the food environment. They offer many multifaceted opportunities and challenges to increasing healthy food availability. And really, when at all possible, it's important to consider systems-based policy approaches that can complement programmatic efforts that are now in the field. As I sign off here, I'd just like to support, um, to, to recognize the support that we've received from a number of funders and that we continue to receive in this area, and also my key collaborators from uh, universities across the country and the Healthy Eating Research Corner Store Working Group, as well as the Minneapolis Health Department and the University of Minnesota. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Perry for her presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about our work here at the New Jersey Department of Health. So I'm going to focus um, primarily on the work we've been pushing out for the past, I'd say, five or six years, and you know, some stuff we're doing right now and a little bit of early stages and future priorities that we have. So these are the most updated statistics for rates of adult obesity in New Jersey, and while we rank pretty well when compared to other states, we're probably around the eighth or ninth cleanest state, give or take, depending on the year, 
that says more really about how dire the situation is nationally really than it does about how well New Jersey is doing overall. So nearly 62% of adults are overweight or obese, um, and as you can see, the costs are really astronomical. Um, and if the rates continue to rise at the current rate, it will cost our state $9.3 billion in health care costs by the year 2018, which is clearly unsustainable. And we also have, um, we have real disparities. So the highest rates are in our poorest counties, such as Cumberland and Salem, which um, if there are New Jersey people on, we'll, we'll recognize that. And we have real hot spots in our poor communities among minorities, low income, and less educated um, populations. So, you know, New Jersey is such an interesting state because we really have such um, wealth, pockets of wealth and pockets of, um, of poverty as well. Looking at, um, looking at childhood obesity, New Jersey has consistently been one of the three states with the highest rates of obesity among low-income two- to five-year-olds. Um, sort of if you listen to the news, you know that we may be seeing some real progress in this area. Um, but just as quickly as the news came out, it was already being disputed, so it really remains to be seen whether there is a real downward trend or not. So um, for a few days, we were out and about saying all kinds of good stuff, and then we've kind of tempered that. Um, again, we see the highest rates in our poorest cities, Trenton and Camden. And again, it's really important to tease out the wealthier, more educated communities for a clear picture, but when we do that, our health outcomes in New Jersey become much less promising. So the Department of Health um, here in New Jersey began to really strategically focus on this issue um, back uh, around 2003, about 10 years ago or so, um, with the development of an obesity prevention task force, um, which was a, a really great, high energetic, uh, very expert group that met for a couple of years and ultimately submitted a report to the governor and legislature in 2006. And as a result of one of their recommendations was that the Office of Nutrition and Fitness was established in 2007. It was the first office in the nation to focus exclusively on obesity. And the office became fully operational in 2008 with the award of the Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity Program grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It was about $4 million over five years. It was awarded to 25 states, and it was really the second, um, it was really the second round of those grants. So New Jersey came in on that second round. Um, and we were tasked with building an infrastructure to coordinate obesity prevention work statewide to support efforts to increase access to healthy food, increase opportunities to be physically active and really routine daily physical activity. And it's interesting, in retrospect, I see this grant as a real luxury because we are not seeing infrastructure um, building dollars um, at this time. And so we were really very, very fortunate because it was a tremendous opportunity. So to do this, um, we began to build the public-private partnership, which is now known as Shaping NJ or Shaping New Jersey. And um, we've created a really robust and multi-sectorial partnership of about 230 organizations. That includes businesses, state departments, and offices, hospitals, nonprofits, universities, national associations, philanthropies, really so many more. Um, it's very diverse. And importantly, um, we're working with partners outside of health, such as transportation planners and the built environment, those areas that are not health-focused but have a great impact on health. And uh, we kind of jokingly refer to them as the unusual suspects, and people usually get a chuckle out of that. Um, so our tagline is making the healthy choice the easy choice. And what this means is pretty simple. It's really about evening the playing field so that people have the opportunity to choose healthy over unhealthy. So we, as we all know, unhealthy is readily accessible, whether it's a highway strip of fast food restaurants, vending machines full of soda, chips, and candy, or streets without sidewalks, parks that are poorly lit. So we really need, our goal is really to make it easier to actually be healthy. So we're promoting healthy, active communities through policy and environmental change. Um, we know we need to reach people at highest risk if we're going to move the needle at all, so our low-income minority and disparate populations. 
and again, using evidence-based strategies and targeting the six behaviors that you see on the, on the right. So this was a very prescribed um, grant. The CDC really told us exactly what they wanted us to do. And so this really reflected this um, shift, the shifting paradigm in the health sector so that you know, research clearly informed that we could not rely on health fairs and disseminating educational materials to create be behavior change, things that health departments, and particularly at the local level, that really relied on this, but that rather we really needed to focus on policy and environmental change where we could reach large numbers of individuals and really create systems change. So um, this is, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a slide. So this is one example of an environmental change that supports physical activity. There are so many more, some that are easy and inexpensive, others that are more challenging and higher cost. So low-cost examples include stairwell prompts, signage in parks and trails, um, the availability of bike racks. Um, on the food side, there are healthy food policies at schools and work sites, healthy concession stands, healthy options in vending machines. And higher cost interventions, of course, include, you know, bringing a new supermarket to an underserved area, um, you know, often up to our food deserts. So going back to the six behaviors a couple of slides ago to address those specific behaviors, Shaping New Jersey Partners met in work groups over a nearly one-year period and identified 10 evidence-based strategies to increase healthy eating and physical activity in five settings. And our five settings are schools, child care centers, communities, health care, um, really the health care sector, and as well as work sites. So some of our accomplishments, um, we had the opportunity, you know, as I mentioned before, this really was an infrastructure building grant, and so we kept looking around and thinking, yeah, but we're going to have to actually do something. And we really um, had a great opportunity to begin implementing some of our strategies um, with the award of stimulus dollars. So I think that was back in, I want to say, maybe 2009 or 2010. So turning toward the healthcare sector, um, we um, had 10 maternity hospitals that we funded with small grants um, under our Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with Baby Friendly, it is a 10-step World Health Organization UNICEF program that directs hospitals toward changing policies in order to promote exclusive breastfeeding. And this resulted in an 11% increase in exclusive breastfeeding rates, as well as four New Jersey maternity hospitals achieving that baby-friendly um, certification. So we went from zero baby-friendly hospitals to four, um, with nearly half of the remaining maternity hospitals now somewhere on the queue working towards this designation. And also with stimulus dollars, we focused on the early care and education setting, spearheading a work group that made recommendations to strengthen state child care licensing requirements around food, physical activity, and screen time. And most of these recommendations were adopted in March of 2013 and implemented in September of 2013. Um, as, and, and this is so, we're so proud of this work also because when you change regulations, obviously you have that built-in sustainability piece um, because they have to do it. They have to make those changes and obviously our licensing folks are out there um, monitoring. Um, as a result of this success, we attracted new funding, and New Jersey is one of nine states funded by the Nemours Foundation for the Early Care and Education Learning Collaboratives Initiative, which has enabled us to build on our work in this setting and provide intensive training and technical assistance um, to child care centers. So we're just finishing up the first year of this five-year um, initiative. We hope to reach close to 150,000 children by the end of the project. And we have um, five collaboratives right now, uh, reaching about 25 or so centers in, in each area. Um, and again, for the New Jersey people, we're in Camden. We then have a southern collaborative. It's three counties. We have a central collaborative, also three counties. And then we have two more collaboratives up in the north.
And um, our third initiative with stimulus dollars funded three pilot community grants, which we then leveraged for additional dollars with um, partners who funded seven additional communities so that our pilot had a total of 10. And um, our funding partners were Partnership for Healthy Kids, um, Walgreens, that was kind of exciting for us, and also a small foundation in New Jersey, Partners for Health. And then we had a second round using lessons learned from the first round, and we funded 18 communities offering technical assistance in the form of a learning collaborative, and we really like that model, that included an innovative social media component so that grantees were blogging and posting to Facebook to share their accomplishments and challenges. We used social media for a few purposes, really. We used it for monitoring grants, definitely different for the Department of Health, building skills among grantees to use social media for obesity prevention and health promotion, and to enable grantees to share projects, accomplishments, and challenges with each other as well as with their communities. And some of the projects included walk bike audits, mapping safe routes to school, installing bike racks along community trails, designs to create safer parks, faith-based congregation wellness policies, um, healthy corner stores, and really many more. And we're now in our third round. We are still collaborating with two of the original three funding partners, and we are now up to 32 communities. So we are really so excited um, about this. Um, some of the other things I'd love to direct you to our website. We have um, produced hands-on, user-friendly toolkits to implement the Shaping NJ obesity prevention strategies. So we have healthy policies and practice for schools. We have a joint use agreement um, for school playgrounds um, with communities. We have best practices in childcare. We have worksite wellness policies and best practices for promoting exclusive breastfeeding. And we also have a number of key reports. We have our state obesity prevention plan, um, which really just goes deeper into a lot of the things that I'm talking about today. We have some evaluation reports from some of our initiatives. We have um, data sheets um, that we provide for our partners, news, events, latest research, and relevant funding opportunities. We also have a great three-minute video, it's real fast-paced and engaging, that really shows our work and highlights our partners. Um, and we've also had some very successful co-branding opportunities. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is, and actually Melissa said it, you know, in terms of building relationships and really um, that has allowed us to really co-brand and to help us in terms of name recognition. So we have healthy concession stands um, with Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. That's at four stadiums. Um, and we have a wonderful Facebook page, um, occasional tweet here and there. Um, so that's another, um, another way that we really reach people. Um, because a really big part of engaging partners is really that communications piece. So I really, again, can't really emphasize that enough. Okay, so where are we now? Well, the Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity Grant, unfortunately, did um, come to an end. And with that, um, the CDC has really directed some changes that have taken place. So obesity prevention work and the Office of Nutrition and Fitness have been integrated into the larger Chronic Disease Prevention and Control Unit. Um, as, again, the CDC has really directed states to bring down those disease silos and work across areas. So poor nutrition, sedentary lifestyles, and tobacco use are the risk factors that cross most or all of the diseases. So we've kind of reorganized around this integrated structure. And the Chronic Disease Office has been awarded a new bundled grant from the CDC. It's about $9 million over five years, um, but it's very ambitious because it, um, it, it is to address heart disease, diabetes, obesity, as well as um, school health. So this slide shows the strategies and settings where the work um, is now focused. So with our New Jersey Hospital Association, we are continuing the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative to bring more maternity hospitals to that baby-friendly designation. 
Um, and we're real hopeful about that, too, because hospitals, as you probably all know, are, are fairly competitive. And so, you know, do you really want to be in the same area with a hospital that is able to say they're baby-friendly and you can't say that? So we've seen some really, really nice, exciting changes um, in that setting. We've also created um, six early care and education policies that can be adopted by centers with corresponding resource kits to actually support policy implementation. So the policies are around family-style dining, so then there's items that go along that can support that. Um, child nutrition, uh, breastfeeding, infant feeding, worksite wellness, um, indoor-outdoor play, and family engagement. And those are really just lovely packages um, of items that, that centers can actually use to help them to implement these policies. And um, we're beginning to develop a pilot program to target registered family child care centers, and we're hoping to adapt the curriculum that we have for this larger initiative that's targeted to larger centers and sort of bring that down and be able to reach children who are in this different setting. So we know we're going to lose the, um, we'll lose the volume of large centers with l lots of children, but we also are, are excited about targeting this new area and being able to reach um, in this venue. And then with the Y State Alliance, they've been a phenomenal partner. The YMCAs are just amazing. Um, using the Healthy You curricula, we are targeting low-income schools to promote a healthier school environment. And with the Food Trust um, in Philadelphia, um, I'm sure Melissa probably knows them, um, all 900 plus of our WIC authorized vendors will receive training on the business case for healthy retail options and in subsequent years will work strategically and on site with some of the pilot corner stores. So we know, you know, again, have, have see the, the challenges firsthand in terms of we can't really ask these business owners to stock items if, if they're not going to be sold and they're, and they're going to lose money. So we really have to work on both ends. And with um, Sustainable Jersey, um, which is a wonderful organization here, we will award small grants to low-income municipalities to promote walking and biking by improving street design and pedestrian, and pedestrian safety. And so, you know, opportunities for New Jersey organizations are certainly to become a Shaping NJ partner. Um, we, we really welcome everyone, but really to implement a strategy, which is really so important. Um, organizations can also model the behavior through worksite wellness. Obviously, they all have their own worksites. Um, there are stairwell campaigns, on-site farmers markets, um, healthy cafeteria um, and vend healthy vending machines, um, healthy food at meetings policies. Uh, physical activity breaks at meetings, and we really try to model all of this for our partners as well. Um, some of our partners have instituted breastfeeding lounges for their um, for their employees, and um, maternity hospitals can implement baby friendly hospital initiative, and then really everybody can join a local healthy community coalition um, because we have really found that the work really does happen at the local level. And finally, you know, our vision for New Jersey, we really, all New Jersey residents will live, work, learn, and play in healthier communities and live healthier lives. And I'll just close with um, my um, contact information. Um, but this has just been a really tremendous um, experience for us, really doing some work in areas that traditionally the Department of Health has not really gone. And that's really it um, on my part, so I will... Um, turn it back over. Very good. Perry, thank you so very much. And Melissa, what a wonderful and robust presentation um, both of you were um, able to give and what, um, what an exciting and, and interesting um, field and, and program to be working in, too. Um, we'd now like to open up for um, our ongoing discussion, and we do have some questions already that have arrived. Um, as a reminder, if you'd like to press star 1, to be placed in the queue to ask your question live over the phone, or you can submit your question using the Q&A feature at the top of the screen. Um, for those of you who would like to request a copy of the slides, you can use the Contact Us link on researchtoreality.cancer.gov. And um, a couple of questions that came in um, very early on in the presentation, um, uh, Melissa and um, 
one was directed to you. Uh, what were the incentives offered to store owners to change? Um, in, in some cases, there have been um, financial incentives, small financial incentives offered to store owners. In other cases, we've just offered um, technical assistance, and really the incentive in Minneapolis is that staple food ordinance that I mentioned at the end of my presentation, that store owners, even with our, with our original staple food ordinance now in place, are required to stock five kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables. And there are a lot of store owners, unfortunately, who aren't or, or traditionally haven't been meeting that, um, that ordinance standard. And so our health department is able to come in and say, you know what, for free, we're going to give you some technical assistance to help you meet and, and sustain those requirements. Um, so, so that, I think, has, has been the most um, persuasive and promising uh, incentive that's been offered here in Minneapolis. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, it, and then, Perry, one, one for you that came in um, also from Darcy. What was it, you spoke about um, co-branding as a way of leveraging partnerships. Can you give an example of um, some of the co-branding that went on during the program or that does go on? Well, for one thing, we have um, we do ask our partners to um, we have a like a shaping NJ widget that we ask them to put on their websites and also to link to us. So that's sort of one of the very simplest. Um, probably the the biggest one is the example that I gave, which is the healthy concession stands at these four New Jersey stadiums, um, where our logo is with you know is on there, it, where we didn't have to contribute any dollars in order to um, have this co-branding. We also just had a wonderful opportunity um, just a couple of weeks ago, the New Jersey Marathon, um, they have a weekend long activities and they did a Shaping NJ 5K run. And so that was also just a great example of it wasn't a, a Department of Health um, event. It was, in fact, the New Jersey Marathon, and they just, as a partner, were able to use our name and our logo, and it was just a tremendous opportunity to, you know, they had wonderful T-shirts with Shaping NJ on it that the runners all got, and it was just, that was a really also great opportunity. So it's getting these partners to actually think about using your logo because it's a benefit to them as well, and then you have this really good win-win situation because our, you know, our name is getting out there, but it's not our event because obviously, you know, we don't have the funds really to do that sort of activity anymore. That's sort of what we lost in um, the end of this grant, and that's sort of what I also what I was referring to as the grant having been a bit of a luxury of being able to actually build um, the infrastructure and do some of that branding activities that we used to do years ago, but we really just don't have funds to do that kind of work anymore. And I think, you know, certainly that's um, a, a common refrain as, as funding streams do change. Um, we have a number of questions for both of you around um, evaluations. So um, let me start with the first one for um, you, Melissa, and then Perry. Um, Hang tight, because there's one coming your way, too. But um, Christy asks, um, we're interested in evaluating the impact of healthy corner stores. Are you aware of corner store indicators that would speak to economic, community, or health benefits? Economic, community, or health benefits. Um, you know, the, those are, I think those are going to be challenging, and, it would really vary by community, I think, depending on what kind of infrastructure given communities have for um, for doing surveillance and collecting data. Um, a lot of the work that I'm aware of that's been that's that's occurred related to corner store evaluation has been more proximal to the intervention, so understanding exactly what's happening inside of the store, right, and doing really um, rigorous evaluation of in-store changes, evaluating impacts on customers specifically in their purchasing that happens in the store in those purchasing occasions, and then to a smaller extent measuring customer impacts in general, not just in their store purchases, but kind of overall are you impacting their store purchases. So. So um, that kind of more broad community level um, evaluation would take, I think, data that's external 
to the corner store program itself. Um, and, and again, I think it would vary depending on surveillance. Um, I'm trying to think on my think on my feet if I can think of anything off the top of my head. I, I would also caution and say I think you'd need a really um, a very high dose of the corner store intervention. You know, very very rigorous, very intensive changes to the, the, the corner store environment in order to see a shift um, at that kind of macro level, uh, unless you're partnering with a variety of other, other kind of um, targets within the community. Great, thank you. And, um, and this is a, a bit of a related question to Perry for you. Um, given the diverse set of PSC policies New Jersey is implementing, what were your or what are your primary evaluation measures that you're using? Are you relying on population surveillance measures or each specific PSD? And how are you determining if the PSD policy is successfully moving the needle? Uh, well, those are really tough questions. And we're sort of right at the beginning of that. The, the kind of um, evaluation that we've really, that we, that we did during the five years of, of nutrition, physical activity, and obesity prevention was primarily around the partnership itself. And so Rutgers University um, actually provided that evaluation to really look at how effective the partnership um, is or was. Um, in terms of, these, of the actual strategies, um, we did look at, um, in terms of like the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, that was a pretty rigorous um, evaluation. Um, but it was small because, again, there were only 10 hospitals. Um, so, again, they were really able to um, look at the, really go out there and look at the changes that they had implemented and the steps were so clear in terms of what they had to do and what they needed to accomplish. Um, but we're really at the very beginning, um, and I'll tell you that the CDC demands um, a lot of, um, I think we have something like 179 measurable um, outcomes for this new grant, although this is larger than just obesity prevention. Um, but we do, I mean, we have an evaluation team um, who would, I wish I had here because it would be much better for them to answer these questions. Um, but that's been a really big piece from day one. But like I said, we really focused on uh, evaluating that, the, the partnership itself and the strength of that. Great. Thanks, and Perry. We'll look forward to um, seeing a reading more about that, um, too, as the project moves forward. Um, it, Melissa, for you, I, I realize everyone, we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I apologize that we started a little late. But um, let's see if we can't get to a couple more questions and then um, continue the conversation um, online. But, um, Melissa, a question to you from Lisa. Regarding the stocking and distribution piece, were there opportunities to link stores with community or urban farmers to get produce if they were having a hard time obtaining fruits and vegetables to sell in their stores? That's something uh, that the health department and some community organizations right now in Minneapolis and, and in other cities um, are, are working on. So that's really a work in progress, I think. Uh, focusing on urban agriculture and how can you get distribution to these small stores of, of urban ag that might be located very close by, of linking up, um, there's examples of linking up with farmers markets to potentially have regular, uh, you know, regular distribution of products or if there are things that don't get sold at the farmers markets, you know, can they somehow get delivered or, or, or picked up by the corner store. We also have an example um, that I think is getting ready to launch soon of, of, you know, a university program, getting students engaged with growing food and then providing it to the corner stores. Um, so, so there's examples of this happening, and I think it's something to definitely keep an eye on, and it's an area for innovation. It's a tricky area, though, I will say, in um, being able to supply a stable stock of the product um, so making sure that corner store owners are able to, to get as much as they need when they need it and they're able to kind of expect and anticipate what they're, what they're going to be able to get, which with some of these mechanisms just may be difficult or, or maybe impossible. And um, delivery can also be a problem. It can, it can be challenging for store owners who, who sometimes are really the only employee of their store to go to a site and, for example, pick up 
you know, farmer's market food at, at the market itself or, or go to an urban ag center, you know, and get the food from that center. Um, so somehow figuring out, often delivery is where there's a stumbling block as well, and figuring out a mechanism of delivery, delivery that's, uh, that's acceptable for both the distributor as well as the, the store itself, um, the store owner itself, is, can be a challenge. Great, and I think, you know, we'll um, end the discussion kind of where, where we began, right, on, on um, you know, that for um, each of these interventions, certainly the challenges, um, you, the challenges are numerous, you know, but um, the creative ways of, of approaching them, you know, is a conversation that we all share. And um, I realize that this is the top of the hour, so um, I'd like to continue this discussion um, online at researchtoreality.cancer.gov, and those of you who's um, – Questions haven't been answered during the cyber seminar. We will be moving them over onto the online community of practice. So um, we'll be reaching back out to you. Um, and then finally, your feedback is very important to us, and we encourage you to um, complete our online evaluation. And the link to the survey will be sent to you um, in email very shortly. And um, as I mentioned, we'll continue this discussion um, online at researchtoreality.cancer.gov where you can continue to engage with the speakers and post questions um, to them and other participants. Um, and um, please look forward to us there. And um, finally, we hope that you'll mark your calendars for our next cyber seminar on June 17th for um, our program on survivorship resources and care planning.